Welcome, welcome everyone uh, to another exciting York Observatory YouTube Teletube broadcast, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. This is Dr. Elena Hyde, and I'm joined tonight by an absolutely wonderful team uh, who are going to tell you all about space telescopes. Um, but first, a little bit about us. We are broadcasting live from the LNI Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And just as a reminder, we broadcast every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time here on YouTube live. But of course, you can find all of our previous broadcasts in our playlists. We actually save them for you just in case you want to catch up on any past action. The York YouTube production works in concert with, of course, um, online public viewing on Mondays. And once it is possible again, we will be having Wednesday night public viewing at the observatory team, uh, giving you live images when possible. Uh, of course, for if you have any questions or comments, you can always email us at observe at yorku.ca, follow us on Twitter or Instagram at York Observatory. And in the meantime, for this broadcast, we will be monitoring the comment area for questions uh, to post content and um, all kinds of uh, you know other news. So if you have questions while the broadcast is happening, feel free to, to chime in. And without too much uh, further ado, um, I'd just like to call out a big thanks to the team who put this presentation on space telescopes to get together. You will be hearing from Guggen, Kat, Obata, Quentin, and Serena. And as a little bit of an intro here to get us started today, although it is very, very cloudy in Toronto, there are some very interesting things that you can see if it's clear in your area for the next couple nights, in particular planets. Um, there are several planets giving a great show in the sky right now. Saturn and Jupiter, um, both visible just after sunset. And if you're willing to stay up a bit later, Mars is absolutely fabulous. And just as a little call out, we are going to get better and better images and views of Mars as we approach October. And that's because in October 13th, Mars will have its opposition. And this is gonna be the best opposition since 2003. Mars will be quite close um, for Mars to Earth. Um, it will not be bigger than the full moon, but it will actually get brighter than um, Jupiter at some points. So it's uh, it, worth keeping an eye on and uh, only going to get better. If you see something very bright and red, it's, it's probably Mars. So just as a, a little, um, you know, uh, what's up uh, if it's clear in your area and as particular the next uh, the next few nights. All right, so that's my uh, um, quick aside. Now I'll hand it over to tonight's team. Take it away, team. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kat, and I'm here with Gagan, Obata, Quinton, and Serena, and we're here from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory at York University. Tonight, we've got a great presentation about space telescopes. Telescopes are very useful tools that can be used for research or for casual everyday use. We will be discussing how light is used by these telescopes to create images, the history of the equipment and models produced over time, telescopes currently in use, research and discovery as a result of these instruments, and several conceptualizations. I will be focusing on different types of light and wavelength, reflecting and refracting telescopes, as well as the history of the telescope to show you just how far we've come. Telescopes use lenses and curved mirrors to gather and focus light from the sky in order to reproduce the image into an eyepiece. Light travels in both particles and waves at different wavelengths, as shown in the electromagnetic spectrum, and telescopes are able to capture wavelengths that the naked eye cannot see. For example, cold gas is visible in the radio wavelength, radiation from the origin of the universe visible through microwaves. Colder stars use radio waves. The outer region of a star is visible to the naked eye. Very hot stars can be seen in the ultraviolet supernova remnants within the X-ray segment, and matter around a black hole is seen in the gamma, gamma ray portion of the spectrum. The colored images that are processed following the creation of an image from a telescope have what are called false colors, as the computer in question can pick up colors that are not visible to the naked eye. These wavelengths are then transcribed into colors that we can see. Since the Earth's atmosphere blocks a lot of the incoming radiation from space, we have built stronger telescopes to see through the haze and into the cosmos above. 
Even some visible light is greatly awry due to the atmosphere, which led to the creation of telescopes such as Hubble, orbiting outside of the Earth's atmosphere, gathering far clearer images to be processed. To begin, there are plenty of components in a telescope that determine the focus and magnification of an image. Primarily, the focal length determines the view angle of the lens, where a longer focal length creates a wider view and vice versa. Magnification, on the other hand, is determined by image sharpness and what it is you will be looking at. Angular magnification of a telescope is given by the focal length of the objective lens in a refracting telescope, whilst in a reflecting telescope through the primary mirror. The reflecting telescope was invented in the 17th century. These telescopes use either a singular or multiple mirrors to produce an image, earning the name as the light is reflected off of the mirror and not refracted. The Gregorian telescope gathers light into its core through the hole, bouncing it off of a primary concave mirror, projecting it as an upside down image onto the secondary concave mirror. There is also a Newtonian telescope model, which is similar to the Gregorian telescope, with the exception of the inner lens angle. Newton angled his, this mirror at 45 degrees so that the light could bounce off of the primary mirror to, at the back of the telescope onto the secondary mirror and into the eyepiece directly above the angled mirror. These types of telescopes are majorly advantageous in the sense that they do not have chromatic aberration, which is color distortion of an image that is viewed through a glass material lens. On the other hand, um, a refracting telescope uses a lens as its objective to create an image whose design is analogous to long focused camera lenses and zoomed lenses such as binoculars. The magnification of this particular telescope is calculated by dividing the focal length of the objective lens by the focal length of the eyepiece, normally characterized as having lenses at the front end followed by a very long tube and an eyepiece at the rear end of the instrument. The main characterization of this telescope is the ability to refract or bend light in such a way where the non-parallel light lines converge on a focal plane, whilst the parallel light lines converge at the focal point. It was unsuccessfully patented in 1608 by Hans Lippershey, a glasses maker in the Netherlands. The angular magnification of a refracting telescope is determined in ratio form by two sets of parallel light rays, beta over alpha. Angle alpha is determined by the resultant of the parallel lines, while the beta angle is found using the optical axis. This angle ratio is ultimately motivated by the retinal image sizes. The Galilean telescope model uses a convergent objective lens and a divergent eyepiece lens, producing an upright image out of the eyepiece. Rays of parallel light are brought into focus on the focal plane of the telescope's objective lens, the diverging eyepiece intervening and making the lines parallel yet again. The non-parallel rays of light hitting the optical axis produce a larger angle. This results the in, in the increase in apparent angular size. One of the earliest telescopes was invented in 1608 by Hans Lippershey, but two years following the decline of his possible patent, Galileo Galilei came up with a slightly improved design. Many problems arose, however, such as a very low field of view and chromatic aberration. But given the limitations of equipment at that time, it does not come as a surprise. Galileo proved the heliocentric model, discovered the four largest moons of Jupiter, as well as the phases of Venus. Post-Galileo, Sir Isaac Newton's model, the simplified reflecting telescope as shown on screen, given the many developments of lenses by that time. Finally, after many years of chromatic and spherical aberration, an achromatic lens was produced to avoid exactly that. One can say it was about time. The 20th century was a breeding ground for telescopes that can see into the other segments of the electromagnetic spectrum. Since then, we've come a very long way, and here to elaborate, I'll be handing it over to Quentin. But first, what did the astronaut Turkey say when he was launched into space? Hubble, 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 Hubble. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Hello, everyone. My name is Quentin, and tonight I'll be telling you about a serious contender for the most famous telescope ever built the Hubble Space Telescope. I'll begin with some basic facts about this instrument, then go into a bit more detail about how it works and the servicing missions that have ensured that it continues to work. At the end of this section, you'll all be treated to some gorgeous astrophotos captured by this fascinating piece of technology. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of the largest and most famous space telescopes currently in operation. It is located in low Earth orbit, 540 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. It is named after the celebrated astronomer Edwin Hubble, who famously proved that there were other galaxies outside of the Milky Way. An international collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency, the telescope was launched on April 24, 1990, aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. 
It is a 13.2 meter long reflecting telescope with a primary mirror 2.4 meters in diameter. And it is capable of detecting ultraviolet and near infrared radiation in addition to visible light. In the 30 years of the space telescope's existence, it has made 1.4 million observations and 17,000 peer reviewed papers have been published based on its results. The HST focuses incoming light using two mirrors in a similar layout to a Gregorian telescope. After the, uh, after the 0 .3 secondary, uh, 0 0.3 meter secondary mirror reflects the light onto the focal plane, various pickoff mirrors direct it onto the sensors of the numerous optical instruments the Hubble is equipped with. These include the Wide Field Camera 3 and Advanced Camera for Surveys, responsible for taking many of the detailed images the telescope is known for, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which perform analysis on the makeup of distant objects based on the wavelengths of light they emit, the Near Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrometer, responsible for analyzing infrared radiation, which humans perceive as heat, and the Fine Guidance Sensor cameras that keep the telescope aligned with its target. The Hubble Space Telescope was designed to receive periodic maintenance by crews of astronauts who would repair and replace the pre-existing instruments and update the telescope with new ones. To date, there have been five such missions. The first, carried out in December of 1993, sought to address a serious problem with the telescope. In addition to numerous pieces of equipment that had failed over the last three years, Hubble's primary mirror had been built with a flaw that severely reduced its ability to clearly resolve images. To fix this problem, the astronauts need to install a lens that would correct for this flaw and focus the light correctly, similarly to how one might give eyeglasses to someone with impaired vision. This mission, one of the most complex in history, was a complete success and allowed the telescope to produce the crystal clear images it is now famous for. The second mission installed the near infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer, allowing the Hubble to study objects that are too cold or too distant to emit visible light. The third mission was planned to be a simple preventive maintenance operation, but the situation suddenly became much more urgent when the fourth of six stabilizing gyroscopes on board the craft failed. The Hubble is unable to operate with less than three functional gyros, so it entered into a dormant state. Servicing mission 3A in December of 1999 replaced all six gyros and brought the Hubble back online. The rest of the planned maintenance occurred during servicing mission 3B in March of 2002 in which several solar panels were replaced and the faint object camera, the last remaining instrument that was present on the Hubble since launch, was replaced by the advanced camera for surveys. Finally, in May of 2009, the last planned servicing mission of the, H of the HST was carried out. During this operation, the Wide Field Camera 3 and Cosmic Origin Spectrograph were installed, completing the current suite of instruments on board. Many other instruments were repaired as well, allowing the telescope to operate at nearly full functionality. These, these upgrades should extend the Hubble's life uh, lifespan significantly, hopefully allowing it to continue operations well beyond the launch of its planned successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. This mission also installed the soft capture and rendezvous system, which will allow the device to safely be deorbited and disposed of when it does reach the end of its life. Now, here are some examples of the stunning ast astronomical images the Hubble Space Telescope has taken over its 30 years of service. Here on the left, we have the distant butterfly nebula, and on the right, a crystal clear image of the planet Saturn. On the left here is an image of the obscured star cluster Westerland II. The right image, nicknamed the Cosmic Reef, depicts two breathtaking nebulae. The blue one is NGC 2020, and the larger reddish one is NGC 2014. On the left here, we have a collection of images of quasars that appear heavily distorted due to gravitational lensing. On the right is UGC 2885, a spiral galaxy much like our own Milky Way. I hope these examples have given you an appreciation for just how impressive the Hubble is. Up next is Serena to talk about its even more ambitious successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. Thanks, Quentin. Now that we have learned about the properties of light, how telescopes function, the engineering of the Hubble Space Telescope, and subsequently its brilliant images, which have expanded our understanding of the universe, let us now take a look at the next generation of space telescope, the highly anticipated James Webb Space Telescope. 
The Hubble provided astronomers with amazing images of distant celestial objects. Unfortunately, Hubble had innate limitations, namely the inability to detect mid-infrared radiation from cooler and or more distant celestial objects, which ultimately prevented astronomers from conducting quality observations of the universe's earliest, most distant and redshifted objects, many of which are well over 13 billion light years away. Observing and studying distant celestial objects such as the universe's primordial star systems and galaxies allow scientists to look back in time and learn about how learn about the origins of our universe. Hubble's successor will be the James Webb Space Telescope, which has finished being built but is currently undergoing extensive testing. When it is deployed, the James Webb Space Telescope will be too far from Earth to be repaired if there are any problems. That is why scientists are conducting extensive testing, delaying the launch as long as they have to, to get everything right. Slated to launch on October 31st, 2021, the James Webb Space Telescope will differ from Hubble in many respects. In fact, another comparable space telescope is the Spitzer Space Telescope, launched in 2003 and retired last January, which primarily co collected infrared radiation from starlight passing through exoplanet atmospheres, determining their chemical composition and whether or not they contain the building blocks for life, which the James Webb Space Telescope will also study in conjunction with studying the most distant celestial objects. It only takes a quick glance at these images of James Webb's primary mirror to realize that it is not a typical mirror we see in our everyday reflecting telescopes. Because the mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope is so large, scientists and engineers had to come up with solutions to problems such as fitting and transporting it on a rocket, polishing such a colossal mirror, how would fare in extremely cold temperatures below minus 220 degrees Celsius, and how it, could, it can reflect as much of the mid-infrared light from its target while canceling out noise and unwanted radiation from the surrounding environment. The primary mirror is composed of 18 hexagonal segments, and each segment can be independently moved and adjusted with motors to correct problems with alignment. The mirror will fold to fit into the rocket and unfold once the telescope reaches its destination at the L2 Lagrange point. The mirror is made of beryllium, which is sturdy at extremely low temperatures. However, scientists and engineers had to hollow out the beryllium component to reduce its weight by a factor of 10. Each of the 18 hexagonal segments is coated in a thin layer of gold. Scientists chose gold because it reflects infrared light extremely efficiently. In total, there are only 50 grams of gold co coating applied to all 18 segments total, and the gold coating was applied very carefully by applying a few atoms at a time. The engineering of the James Webb Space Telescope's mirror is a monumental achievement for humanity, and we cannot wait to see the results. Another one of the distinctive features of the James Webb Space Telescope's new design is its sun shield. Since a substantial component of the research objectives are to observe the universe's most distant objects, they are so dim and redshifted that the telescope must remain below minus 220 degrees Celsius to be able to efficiently observe the mid-infrared radiation without noise from the environment and the telescope itself, which can radiate mid-infrared radiation when its temperature goes above minus 220 degrees Celsius. The sun shield will block out radiation and heat from the sun, earth, and moon. The sun shield is composed of five layers of polyamide film as thin as a human hair. The film layers are coated in aluminum on both sides and dope silicone on the sun facing side to reflect the radiation away from the James Webb telescope. During the testing of, of the deployment of the sun shield, some layers did produce tears. So scientists had to delay its launch in order to fix these issues. The James Webb Space Telescope will revolve around the sun instead of the Earth at the L2 Lagrange point. A Lagrange point is a stable region in space where the gravitational forces of a two body system like the sun and the Earth produce enhanced regions of attraction and repulsion. These can be used by spacecraft to reduce fuel consumption needed to remain in position. The L2 Lagrange point will provide the James Webb Space Telescope with a stable halo orbit with an altitude with respect to Earth from 374,000 kilometers to 1,500,000 kilometers, and an orbital period of six months. 
The advantage of orbiting the L2 Lagrangian point is that the James Webb Space Telescope will avoid the shadows of the Earth and the Moon, unlike Hubble, which enters Earth's shadow every 90 minutes. Along with the unimpeded view of the sky, James Webb's orbit will not require a lot of its rocket thrusters to keep it within its desired region. The greatest advantage of this orbit is that if anything goes Sorry, the greatest disadvantage of this orbit actually is that if anything does go wrong, it would be pretty much impossible to go to Webb and fix it. That is why the telescope has been continuously delayed for more than 14 years. However, if successful, the James Webb Telescope will provide humanity with a window into the universe's origins and possibly revolutionize the field of astrophysics. Thank you, Serena. Moving on, we'll be outlining some of the revolutionary astronomical discoveries that the many various space telescopes have contributed to our understanding of the universe. Before any notable discoveries are to be found, researchers from around the world, regardless of nationality or academic affiliation, may apply for observing time on the Hubble Space Telescope. The applications are extremely competitive and are given on a time-based period of how significant the discoveries might be. All applications and requests to access the Hubble Space Telescope are processed by the Space Telescope Science Institute, or SCSI for short. The SCSI operates the Hubble Space Telescope on behalf of NASA. The director of the SCSI is given 10% of the total observing time, where at their discretion can allocate the time to any project they deem scientifically interesting. In 1995, the current director of the SCSI awarded the discretionary time to astronomer Bob Williams, who intended on pointing the telescope to a seemingly unsuspecting dark patch in the sky. The result of this risky observation resulted in one of the most well-known and amazing images Hubble has captured, as shown on the bottom right. Each smudge, smear, and point is an entire galaxy, and each galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. This comes to show the incredible magnitude of our universe. In total, astronomers using Hubble have published around 17,000 scientific papers and journals, which makes the telescope the most productive and active scientific instrument ever conducted, and a triumph in human ingenuity. Many of you are probably familiar with the fact that the universe is 13.7 billion years old, but how do scientists discover this number? The Hubble Space Telescope is what allowed astronomers to pin down the age of the universe from an estimate of 10 to 20 billion years to an approximate of 13.77 billion years. Hubble measures the brightness of Cepheid variable stars, which are very distant stars that periodically change in brightness. They serve as a sort of cosmic yardstick to deduce measurements of distance from the Earth. By measuring the most distant Cepheid variable stars, which only Hubble can capture with great accuracy, scientists can pinpoint the age and size of the universe. In addition to this data, scientists use the famous cosmic microwave background image, as seen in the bottom right, to provide very solid data about the age of the universe. The image represents the emissions of the early universe shortly after the Big Bang. The CMB is a crucial part in understanding the origins of our universe. It was mapped primarily by the WMAP and the Planck Space Telescopes, which is another feat for the importance of space telescopes. From observations, Hubble is able to provide decisive evidence that black holes are present in the center of almost every galaxy. The black holes are enormous and have masses ranging from billions to billions of times mass, uh, sorry, uh, ranging from millions to billions of the time, uh, mass of our sun. By serving hundreds of other galaxies containing supermassive black holes, Hubble showed that the black hole sizes are related to the size of their galaxy. The bigger the black hole, the bigger the galaxy. Hubble has also been able to trace the growth of galaxies by looking further into space, you're able to look further back in time. So by collecting information about the most distant galaxies and tracing that information to more closer and closer galaxies, scientists were able to provide very accurate models of the growth information of galaxies. If you're interested in more about black holes, make sure to check out our previous Teletube episode in the playlist live stream on our YouTube channel. Moving on to another space telescope, the Kepler telescope, which is named after the 17th century astronomer Johannes Kepler. The Kepler telescope was exclusively designed to capture speculated exoplanets and other star systems. Due to the extreme distance of exoplanets and the fact that planets don't emit their own light, capturing an image of another planet is very difficult with today's technologies. Instead, the Kepler telescope and other ground-based telescopes in this case use something called the transit method. It detects planets by measuring periodic dips in the luminosity of their parent star. We can also use this method to roughly determine the composition of these exoplanets. All stars emit their own spectral signature which resembles a pattern of light emissions based on their composition. When planets pass in front of their star, they observe very specific wavelengths of the star's emitted light. When this data is available, astronomers can deduce the composition of exoplanets. The Kepler telescope is very effective at taking observations. 
is optimized for exoplanet detection and has discovered 2,663 exoplanets orbiting the stars in our solar neighborhood. Several other discoveries found by space telescopes are in, our, are in our own solar system. For example, the image of Pluto at the top right was taken by the Hubble telescope in 2010. Later on, NASA sent the New Horizons spacecraft to image Pluto with much greater accuracy. Shown below, scientists uh, were able to extract so much useful information about the distant dwarf planet, which no early terrestrial telescope could find. Another example was in 2009, when the comet shoemaker levy 9 plunged into Jupiter's atmosphere, leaving a temporary charred mark the size of the Pacific Ocean. This allowed astronomers to expand their understanding of Jupiter's atmosphere. Hubble was also responsible for countless other groundbreaking discoveries and observations that we were otherwise unable to see with ordinary telescopes. Some include the auroras of Saturn and Jupiter, the changing icy surface of Europa, and the discovery of thousands of asteroids, comets, and other orbiting bodies in our solar system. There are many interesting discoveries taking place here in our solar system, but to cover that, we would need another, we would need another Teletube episode later. Next up, Gagan will be discussing some of the future conceptualized missions for other space telescopes. Thank you, Obata. Now that we've covered some of the main aspects of space telescopes in recent years, I'd like to talk about future concepts and missions expected in the coming years. As Serena mentioned, the James Webb Space Telescope is a hotly anticipated mission that has been delayed numerous times. The James Webb Space Telescope is an orbiting infrared observatory that will complement and extend the discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope with longer wavelength coverage and greatly improved sensitivity. The longer wavelengths enable Webb to look much closer to the beginning of time and to hunt for the unobserved formation of the first galaxies, as well as to look inside dust clouds where stars and planetary systems are forming today. JWST will be the premier space observatory for astronomers worldwide, acting as successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. The telescope will have a 6.5 meter diameter optical instrument made up of 18 composite mirrors. It has been hoped for by the scientific community for many years. In 2011, it was supposed to launch in 2018. In September, officials pushed that back to 2019. As of this broadcast, NASA is now targeting October 31st, 2021 for the launch. The International Lunar Observatory 1 mission will be the first mission to send a telescope to the moon. Unlike the other missions we've talked about today, this mission is actually a private mission and is not being organized by any specific space agency. The International Lunar Observatory Association, or ILOA, plans to launch a craft to the moon, where a telescope will be deployed and stationed. Since the moon has no atmosphere and lunar nights are much longer than Earth nights, observations from the lunar south pole would have an increased quality and the telescope would have capacity for non-stop observations during lunar nights. While the telescope is small, only seven centimeters in primary mirror diameter, the mission in general would serve as a trial for future lunar observatory missions to test conditions and quality of research from the moon. The Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, LISA, will be the first space-based gravitational wave observatory. Selected to be ESA's third large class mission, it will address the science theme of the gravitational universe. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time created by suitably accelerated objects, such as pairs of black holes coming together and merging. LISA will be the first mission probing the entire history of the universe using gravitational waves. The telescope will consist of three spacecraft separated by 2.5 million kilometers in a triangular formation, following Earth in its orbit around the Sun. The separation of free-floating reference surfaces in each satellite is measured precisely using laser interferometry over the 2.5 million kilometers long arms in order to detect and measure minuscule variations caused by a passing gravitational wave. The adjustable format with the free-floating reference surfaces means that many types of gravitational waves can be detected, and launch of the LISA is expected in 2034. Another mission, Breakthrough Starshot Alpha Centauri aims to demonstrate proof of concept for ultra-fast light-driven nanocrafts and lay the foundations for a first launch to Alpha Centauri within the next generation. Along the way, the project could generate important supplementary benefits to astronomy, including solar system exploration and detection of Earth-crossing asteroids. In the last decade and a half, 
Rapid technological advances have opened up the possibility of light powered space travel at a significant fraction of light speed. This involves ground based laser beamer pushing ultra light nanocrafts, miniature space probes attached to light sails to speeds of up to 100 million miles an hour. Such a system would allow a flyby mission to reach Alpha Centauri in just over 20 years from launch, beaming home images of its first recently discovered planet Proxima b and any other planets that may lie in the system, as well as collecting other scientific data such as analysis of magnetic fields. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE for short, is the first large class mission in ESA's Cosmic Vision 2015 to 2025 program. Planned for launch in 2022 and arrival at Jupiter in 2029, it will spend at least three years making detailed observations of the giant gaseous planet Jupiter and three of its largest moons, Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa. These three moons in particular are thought to conceal oceans of liquid water beneath their icy crusts. To explore the atmosphere, magnetosphere, and tenuous rings of Jupiter, as well as to characterize its three ocean-bearing moons, JUICE will support 10 state-of-the-art instruments. These include cameras, spectrometers, a submillimeter sounder, an ice-penetrating radar, an altimeter, a radio science experiment, and sensors to monitor the magnetic fields and particle environment, as well as a radio interferometry experiment. All these sensors are sure to make the JUICE an interesting mission. The Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars mission, or PLATO, is a space observatory mission planned by the European Space Agency to search for planetary transits around stars and more specifically, search for terrestrial planets in the habitable zone around sun-like stars. The habitable zone around sun-like stars is the zone where liquid water is able to exist on the surface of the planet. This mission is essentially going to be looking for Earth-like planets that have the possibility of harboring life. The mission is planned to launch in 2026 and will be stationed at an Earth-Sun L2 point similar to the James Webb Space Telescope. The space observatory will consist of 26 refracting telescopes, each with a 12 centimeter diameter, which will combine to observe planetary transits around hundreds of thousands of stars. Well, everyone, you have been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly Teletube broadcast, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Kat, Quinton, Serena, Obata, and myself, Guggen. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comments section of the video below. You can always connect with us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact information at observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thanks for tuning in, clear skies, and have a good night. Thank you very much, everyone. And just as a reminder, we will be taking a few questions over in the chat for this video uh, for the next few minutes if you do have questions uh, to ask us there. Have a great evening, everyone.